I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Tayana Lee McQuiller, a tarot reader and researcher of religion, esoterica, and mysticism. She's the author of several books, including Root Work, Creole Fire, Tupac Shakur, The Life and Times of an American Icon, co-authored with Fred Johnson, as well as the author of the Hoodoo Tarot and the Sibyl's Oraculum, both which include artwork by Caitlin Foisy. Tayana's upcoming book is Astrology for Mystics, forthcoming from Inner Traditions. She is available for readings and consultations, and you can find her at Instagram at Tayana Lee McQuiller. If you're listening to this episode on the Rendering Unconscious podcast stream, please know there is also a video of this discussion on YouTube. Just find Rendering Unconscious podcast at YouTube at Trapart Films YouTube channel. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T R A P A R T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon. P A T R E O N dot com forward slash V A N E S S A two three C A R L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, Dr. Vanessa Sinclair dot net, or the podcast main website renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Um, so I started in 2003 with Root Work, and that was my very first book. Yes, there it is. (laughs) And I was a student at the time at City College, an anthropology student. Um, And I was on a scholarship, a Mellon uh, teaching fellowship, actually. Um, And I wanted to write a book about root work because there weren't any books at the time that were really personal from someone that kind of knew the culture and had it in their lineage, but there were like a ton of other books um, from other traditions like Santeria and um, Voodoo and things like that. So I just was really annoyed um, that there wasn't any books about Voodoo and we're here in the United States. Um, And it's funny because I was taught by my mom, like, hey, if you don't uh, see a book that you like, then you have to write it, (laughs) you know? So I kind of took that advice and said, well, instead of like kind of bitching about it, I'm just going to write it. Unfortunately, because I did not have a degree at the time, I couldn't like really use like academic language according to my mentors at City. Um, So anyway, so that's how I got started. And I wrote a couple of other books on different topics in between there. But um, fast forward to like three years ago, um, I started seeing just a ton of other books about hoodoo and root work, and it's just like this big trend now. So I thought, well, this is a perfect time for me to be free, you know, and now that I am free, I'm not in school anymore, I don't have any mentors to answer to, um, you know, I can just do my own thing, and I'm also 20 years older, you know, and I'm more confident in my voice, so I just decided to, you know, to just put my, put my hat in the ring, you know, and just go for it and update the information, clarify a few things um, that that I put in the original book. So there it is. Yeah, so tell us about the Hoodoo Tarot. 
Well, I have been into tarot for, I don't know, upwards of over 20 years, like maybe 96. I started really like exploring the tarot. I've been using tarot for a long, long time. And I just thought this would be the perfect marriage um, to have, you know, kind of hoodoo uh, concept um, interwoven with the, the, the hero's journey, you know, with the tarot. And so that's, that's what started it. And since Caitlin was already a personal friend of mine, she's an amazing artist, Caitlin Foisy. Um, I just said, you know, hey, let's do this. And she was all for it. I didn't have to ask twice. Like she was so excited because she's familiar with root work. And um, so that's how we decided to collaborate. And so what are the cards like? And what's the story like, the Hoodoo Tarot? Well, I decided to just kind of make a list of famous root workers um, that I felt could be used um, for the majors and and the minors, you know, but but, je but definitely for the majors. So I made a list of all the root workers that I was familiar with. Um, some wanted to be in the deck and some didn't. I just really had to use my intuition because sometimes people contact me like, hey, you know, where's so-and-so? And I'm just like, I, I came across that person or I'm familiar with that person that I have been for many years, you know, especially during my original research, you know, many, many years ago. But I just, I, if I didn't feel it, I didn't put them in there. Um, and I also decided to use my cousin um, who passed away in the early 40s and obviously never got a chance to meet her, but I met her through my grandmother's stories. Um, so she is Miss Robinson, which is the devil card in the standard uh, tarot deck. Um, so that's why, that's what I decided to do, and to use the stories that were compatible um, with the standard tarot message. Um, you know, I just, I just literally just put it together, you know, and it worked out. I mean, people have been really responding to it. I've been really happy about that. Yeah, and you specifically do ancestral readings with it. Yes, I do. Um, that has been something I've been doing with Rider Waite for a long time for like personal friends um, and stuff like that and myself, but like it just wasn't gelling for me. It just it didn't it didn't feel as good as it does now, you know, because I'm using the images, I'm using you know the symbols that I like it clicks immediately, you know, because I created the deck. So you know, I've been using and. Um, this, this spread called the, uh, the Ancestors spread, uh, see about your folks Ancestors spread. Um, and it's just, it's just been amazing. And um, I'm just really, really honored to, to help people in that way, you know, cause I've always loved working with the dead. I'm a Halloween baby. Um, so, you know, that's what that aspect has always been with me. I love old people. I just, I'm an antiquarian just in general. Uh, period films and things like that. So I'm never far away from the past. I'm never far away from the spirits of those that have already transitioned. I'm comfortable in that realm and I'm comfortable helping other people um, to figure some things out because we all have a story, um, you know, many stories actually in our maternal and our paternal lives um, that, I, you know, stuff that we need to heal, stuff that we need to work out. And especially now, like, you know, like I said, it's so popular. It's everything spiritual is so popular and ancestors are, you know, people are talking about them a lot more. And I wanted to help people to kind of do that deep dive, you know, um, to kind of understand where they stand with their ancestors and things like that. So that's been really a lot of fun. It's been rewarding. It's been tough also because I get all kinds of reactions. Sometimes people scream, sometimes people cry, sometimes people hang up on me. Um, you know, I just ask that they don't talk about my mother. That's all I ask them not to do, but I've, I've experienced so many different reactions and it's just been something, I tell you. Yeah, it's really deep, intense work, but it definitely needs to be done. Of course, I had my reading with you and I loved it and I talk about it all the time. I highly recommend them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's intense. It's it's a lot, especially if you come from a family with like a lot of different, you know, issues of abuse and thing. You know, a lot of stuff that, you know, people don't realize it has impacted them as much as, as it has. You know, it's it's not until you kind of you are sitting there and you're listening. It's like, oh, you know, as you know, you know, things come up. 
you know, or things that you need to face, you know, you don't realize that somebody that lived 150 years ago can still be affecting um, your life today. So we're, you know, it's just, it's all an illusion, that, that, that separation. And I think that that's what people are really, really seeing when they get an ancestral reading is, you know, 1800s, it's not that far away. It really is. It's like three grandparents away, not much, you know? No, it's so. really true. It's really recent. Absolutely. And when you think about it in terms of genealogy, you know, and I think that that's where people kind of really, it really hits them that it's really not that far. When you stop looking at dates and start looking at people and like not making your ancestors some kind of abstraction, it's like, wait a minute, you know, um, your great grandmother was just here and she's right, you know, she's, she's in the 1900s. She's right there at the turn of the century. And it's just like, whoa, I didn't realize that. So for example, my grandmother had a friend um, named Mrs. Williams. And I think this is when I really, really, it really got to me. Um, you know, just like how close we are to the past. And Mrs. Williams was 102 years old. Um, she passed away about three years ago at 102. And I spoke to her when she was about 100 and she was talking about her grandmother and she said her grandmother and her mother lived to be 100. So, I, you know, it, it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute, what year were you born? She's like, oh, 1917. Think about it. Her mother lived to be 100 and her grandmother. So the wisdom and the lessons that she would teach me and tell me about was going back 200 years, you know? So that's pretty heavy, in my opinion. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of ancient wisdom, we should talk about the Sybil's Oraculum as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, as a writer, it's so funny because, you know, there's so many things that I want to talk about and, you know, so many different incarnations of myself. And it's like being a writer is, you, the, the good part is that you're preserved in amber, you know, but then it's also kind of the downside as well, because you grow faster and you continue to grow, but then that, that version of you is still, um, you know, it's, it's just locked in there, you know, but um, anyway, I don't know. I just felt like I needed to mention that. I think that's something that every writer has to face. You read something from like 10 years ago and you're like, who the hell is that? You know, you went through so many different experiences. But anyway, The Sibyl's Oraculum was the oracle I created right before the Hoodoo Carol. And I've always been interested in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient Egypt. That's always been something I'm excited about. I'm an 80s kid, so I grew up with Clash of the Titans and, you know, it, all of those old technical color movies with the bad animation, you know, um, those, you know, that's what was going on, you know, and I loved it. And I loved like these historical epics like Cleopatra. Um, and then you get the nineties with Xena, you know, and then the gods come to life, you know, with these wonderful actors and everything. So, you know, and on top of that, I'm, I'm also interested in suppressed history and information. Um, so that was my opportunity to kind of, you know, just kind of bring forth all the information that I had amassed since I was a kid, really, um, and do the Sibyl's Oraculum. And what, I, what the Sibyl's Oraculum is all about is the suppressed history of African deities kind of um, copy-pasted um, by the Greeks and the Romans. Because, you know, the Romans copied the Greeks and then the Greeks copied the ancient Egyptians and other uh, Near Eastern uh, cultures. And, you know, so it kind of created like this alphabet soup um, but unfortunately, you know, the kind of colored history of the uh, of ancient Greece and Rome has been horribly, horribly suppressed. And, you know, so I just decided, hey, you know, I'm going to add to that conversation because there were other authors um, that have, you know, touched on this. But again, people feel uncomfortable, you know, talking about all of the whitewashing or the, you know, just the complete erasure. Um, of these facts. So that was just my way of adding on to that conversation in a manner in which um, I'm comfortable, which is always with spirituality um, and helping people to work through their stuff. Because, you know, Sybils is also that kind of deep dive deck as well. Um, just kind of giving you an assessment, you know, like I have an assessment quiz in the, 
in the beginning of the book um, so that you can know, you know, just where you stand, you know, spiritually. And, you know, also personalize your experience. And that's very, very important to me because like the mixed spirituality, I call it, that's out here, you know, you have to look a certain way, you have to talk a certain way, you have to uh, adopt the same concepts. Um, and that's creating, in my opinion, a lot of harm. Um, you know, uh, it's just very repressive. So it's like, you know, people are very excited to leave uh, what they feel are dogmatic, uh, traditions, whether it be Abrahamic or whatever, um, but it seems like they've, you know, <laughs> they've gone from one church to the other, um, you know, with, you know, it's kind of a cookie cutter mold that people are expected to follow. So what my uh, objective with anything that I'm doing is to get people to look at themselves as themselves, no one else. It doesn't matter, you know, what so-and-so your favorite you know, Instagram personality or YouTube personality says it has to be. If you're really about personalizing your experience, then personalize it and don't be afraid, you know. Um, you know, but hey, we're people, right? So I think that a lot of times, even if people do want to do that, they're afraid of ostracizing, um, you know, because people are social. And if they go too far off the grid, even if it's a so-called, you know, eclectic path, you know, um, there's still certain things they're expected to believe or to perceive if they are part of that community. Um, and so people hide themselves even within these so-called free paths, you know, but it's not really that free if you have to hide. So anyway, that that's what I'm all about is being yourself and getting to know yourself as yourself. Otherwise, you're going to miss the mark. It really doesn't matter what system you're in. You know, that's just my personal belief. It really doesn't matter because I see people that are repressed and um, oppressed in every single tradition that I've encountered and I've been in the game a long time. Yeah, I feel like that's just an aspect of kind of being a person, especially in groups. You're always going to have these kind of dynamics play out no matter what field you're looking at. It's just like human, human nature That's to right. do that somehow. Right. And it's, you know, for somebody like me, it's a little bit easier because I'm already introverted and stuff, but I can't even imagine being someone that generally, you know, just genuinely really gets energized by, you know, a lot of people and stuff like that. I mean, you're kind of stuck, you know, kind of playing a game. And I've never really fit in to any particular group. I've tried many, many times, you know, in different traditions and I've been initiated in different traditions and things like that. And it's just like, wherever I go, it's sort of like, oh, you know, Tiana, you're kind of got to do like this and you have to dress like that or, you know, and it's, it's kind of the, the, the boundaries, the thought space um, that is created that I've always just broken down or, or I just wanted to beat down and it's been frustrating to my teachers. And so I said, okay, well, I'm some kind of mystic, you know, that was my first kind of uh, notion. But then I, I tried, I really had to go deeper with that because I didn't want to just make an excuse, you know, because some people just say that they're mystics or they say that they're solitary or whatever sometimes just to get away from, you know, discipline. And that's not really my issue, but I had to check first to make sure that wasn't my issue. So I stuck around a long time um, within these groups and did what I had to do within certain group um, until I just realized, hey, this is just not for me. I am, you know, just not. And even if, it's, even if you are in tune with whatever the morals and values and uh, traditions or whatever, the, uh, the ritual and the rites of whatever your path is, the social, the social dynamics or the politics of the people within those groups that seem to kind of go hand in hand, then that doesn't match. So it's like you want to hang out with, say, you know, your coven, you know, members or maybe your Elay or whatever you're dealing with. Um, and you just want to do that work. <laughs> you just want to do that spirit from work, but there's always going to be that social point, that team player aspect that I've either fallen short on disagreeing with the, you know, the, the dogma of the group or I disagree with the politics that seem to be 
naturally adjacent to the 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 spiritual uh, tradition, which you, what doesn't which usually doesn't have anything to do with it, but they've made it that way. Mm-hmm. So then I fall short in that way. So I'm just like, you know what? I, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'm just gonna do my own thing. And pretty much that's where I am now. I just came back home to root work and because that's what it was all about anyway. It was never, you know, meant to be like this big um, group experience or not meant to be, but you know, usually it's not, you know, it's just sort of somebody taking care of people and really taking care of your, yourself. And, you know, and if you are taking care of community, it's not in the same way as like other traditions. So I'm like, wait, why am I doing this? Like, I'm gonna go home. Because <laughs> it feels natural to do things my way and the way that it's done here. Okay. Um, so about three years ago, my grandmother like started to get really, really sick. And so I already started like fiddling around with ancestry and um, different kind of um, ancestral sites, you know, um, to do my genealogy. And, but like when she got sick, it's like really when I started going really hard because she's always been really, really open about, you know, family history. And she's told me as much as, you know, that she remembers. Um, but I felt like the sense of urgency um, to get everything out of her while she was still here. So while she was sick, I would literally sit there with the laptop and go over census records with her and she would you know she would get tired but you know she's like okay you're ready to do that stuff again you know at first she was kind of annoyed but then she got really into it because she was seeing her stories come to life and some of the stuff she didn't even know if it was you know verifiable and you could find it and whatever but she was confident and she trusted you know what she was told and um you know what's interesting about it is that you know she would tell me about you know somebody um, and then they would show up on the census as, you know, like their birth name, like she'll say Pookie, like, you know, for example, and it's just like, well, I'm looking for Pookie James, but damn it, his name is Greg, you know, <laughs> that's why you're not finding him, you know, or vice versa, somebody can have a, you know, uh, John Smith, for example, but they went, the census taker actually put Pookie, <laughs> it's very interesting, so you just have to, that's why a lot of people don't find their ancestors is because a lot of times census takers would put nicknames down by accident, you know, because they weren't really paying attention. Okay, somebody said that somebody's name is Rainbow, then that's what it is, you know, when everybody just called them Rainbow, you know. So at any rate, um, that's how I got started with genealogy research. And if you go on my Instagram page, you know, I'll post about ancestors that permit me to, you know, there's a lot of stuff I find. And I, again, it's just the same like with the Ruby Tarot. I, kind of really tune in on who does it or who, you know, doesn't mind other people, um, you know, to look at them or whatever. There's a lot of people, I'm like, please, they're like, no, no, no. (laughs) So it's just like, okay, you know, I just have to go with the feeling there, you know, and I do readings to like verify if they're okay, you know, because ultimately I wouldn't want to invade anybody's privacy. Like I know in legal, the legal world, like the dead have no rights, but that's not my tradition at all. Um, the dead, the dead absolutely have rights, and they have to be asked whether they want to participate um, in whatever you know, because it's still their image, the image they had, or the name they had, or the hair they have, you know. So I just try to be respectful of all uh, people, whether they have a physical body or not. Um, but so you know, so I, I write about my journey with genealogy and. Um, and I honestly believe that, um, you know, taking care of your ancestors, your tangible bloodline ancestors is like critical. I'm not adverse to, um, you know, exploring paths from other cultures, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of nourishment that you can get from another culture, you know, or you feel connected just to another culture that has absolutely nothing to do with your tangible bloodline ancestry. However, I do feel that that is problematic when your own tangible bloodline ancestors are starving um, and your offerings and your love and your appreciation and your prayer um, is all going, you know, to other people's ancestors um, and in the form of deities as well, because I've mentioned this before, um, you know, most deities are deified ancestors if you really 
look back on, you know, their legend and the spiritual myths um, that, you know, explain their creation or whatever. Usually they were people that, that did something badass, you know, and they got, you know, kind of elevated to that kind of uh, status, you know. So I just would say to people, like, hey, no matter who you are, what you are, you know, find out who you are. If you don't know, if you're not sure, trust your elders, get to know your ancestors, make sure they're fed. You know, it's sort of like, imagine if you're, you know, hosting a cookout and you're like feeding everyone else in the neighborhood and your ancestors are in the kitchen, like, hey, where's my plate, you know? Um, so I, I personally, not, this is not a theory, in my personal life, my, my life has just improved tremendously. And I didn't have a, a bad life at all. Like I've had a pretty good life as far as lives go. Um, but I've, I've grown spiritually, mentally, a lot of blessings have come into my life ever since I started really um, serving my tangible bloodline ancestors and respecting their traditions and learning about them because that is an ancestral offering. Um, genealogy is an ancestral offering in my opinion, um, you know, because we hear about ancestral, ancestral offerings and altars all the time, fruit, rum, or whatever people put on their altars or chickens, whatever. Um, but an offering is knowing their names and, you know, getting to know their stories, you know, and caring about what life was like. What did they eat? What did they do? You know, who, who were their friends? Where did they, what sights and smells did they experience? I think that's a beautiful offering. I know I wouldn't want to be forgotten, especially if my, you know, third descendant, you know, maybe some down, somewhere down in like 20, 2090 or whatever, or 3000, you know, if they have a way of knowing who I am, I wasn't a bad person, um, you know, find out who I am, you know, especially if you're asking me for shit, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, people are like asking their ancestors for all kinds of stuff, like treating them like genies, you know, and like they're not even people, and, that, and I've seen that a lot over the 20 years too, it's like, it's, like their ancestors are like these weird abstractions, you know, and I think genealogy is a way of reconnecting with them in real time and closing that gap because they're right there. So that's how I think it can be applied to spiritual practice. Yeah. That's amazing. No, and I think it's so important, especially now, and I feel like it's, it's coming to the forefront a lot more now than it has in the recent past. And people are becoming, seem to be becoming right. more interested in this. Right. But you know, the challenge is when people, I think, especially, in my experience, that some people do not want to connect with their ancestors for whatever reason. Maybe there's a painful past. Maybe they had an abusive grandfather. You know, you can have a pedophile in the family. You can have, you know, incest in the family. You can have somebody that ran away, a mother that abandoned you, whatever. And so you attributed the, the horrors of certain people in your family um, that has damaged the family. Um, to an entire culture, you know? So now you don't want to study, I don't know, Mexico or whatever, if you're Mexican, right? I don't want anything to do with that. My mother was Mexican, uh, you know, and she hurt me, you know? So then a, a whole lot of ancestors, the whole lineage gets wiped away because of that person. So I've been telling people if they experience that, you know, like, hey, you're not a bad person. Like, what would happen if, if you have kids, like, how would you feel if, like, your great-great-grandchild threw away your entire culture because maybe your kid became a jerk or abusive or something like that? Does the whole culture have to be thrown away because of that experience? That's that person's problem. That's that person's uh, legacy for themselves, but it doesn't have to be a whole family legacy and a whole lot of ancestors that were good, decent people um, don't have to be thrown away you know, just because of, you know, one or two people dropping the ball and being irresponsible, or, you know, harming other people, you know. So that's been an important thing because I know all about that. You know, there are some, some of our ancestors, very recent ancestors, like I said, grandparents, whatever, that really hurt the family, you know, and did some really irresponsible stuff. So, but I just ask people to please just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, 
go back as far as you can until you, you know, if, if everybody's been kind of screwed up and it happens, you know, for like four or five generations. So people can be screwed up that long. Trust me, there are thousands and thousands of people that it took to create each and every one of us. And to let four or five people um, ruin it is just, you know, that's not fair. And that's too much to me, you know, to give them the people that they want, you know. Yeah, Carl and I took a boat to a different uh, island in Sweden a couple of weeks ago. And since he's family, they're all mm -hmm. from Sweden. They're all from Sweden and Finland, this area. So he's been able to, to trace his ancestors mm -hmm. back pretty far, pretty easily, you know, um, because they didn't move right. around or anything. And he learned of this battle wow. between two of his ancestors that was like, 800 years ago he found these two people that he was related to <laughs> and that they had a battle and that one of them like leaped off a cliff and so he survived so they both survived and we were wow. just thinking if this one guy hadn't jumped off a cliff like 800 years ago you wouldn't be the same person you are right now and how like right. amazing that is <laughs> It's amazing, and it's amazing how far I've gotten back on certain branches. I've gotten back to I think the oldest ancestor was born in the 1500s. Wow. Um, you know, and then, yeah, it's it's really amazing, and especially for you know Black Americans, it's like sort of like being a big myth that none of us can trace ancestors back. Man, I mean, a lot of Black Americans feel like they just can't get back there, and it's absolutely a lie. It was some. It was the biggest lie that we were told, um, and I and so many other people have managed to trace our ancestors, and um, it's just been like, you know, just mind blowing, and just kind of just how everything intersects, you know, um, in living history and finding ancestors that were in the war of 1812. I find a lot of ancestors in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, King Philip's War. I mean, my, I have relatives literally that have been around, um, you know, since the beginning of the colony um, and beyond, you know. It, of course, the paper trail stops where the oral history stops because indigenous people, you know, that was how they recorded information is orally. So, but as far as like, as as much paper as I can trace, I've managed to do so on many lines. It's an ongoing process, but it's been a very deep spiritual journey. Um, and like I said, it's an ancestor offering, and I, I pray to them before I get on the computer, and that has helped me too. Every time I hit a brick wall, I'm just like, please, I want to find you. Whatever you did, you know, in life, maybe people are ashamed, you know? of what they did. I didn't find all good people. I found some messy people. I found slave owners that looked like me, okay? And I found all kinds of people, you know, rapists. I found one rapist, you know. I found some really beautiful people. I found chiefs, and I found, you know, artists, and I found all kinds. You're going to find everybody, you know, and I think that's another reason people don't want to do it um, is because when they, like, want to put it off is because you're not sure what you're going to get. I, have, I was already resolved, so I think that was a little easier for me because I know people are people and I don't take it as like, oh, you know, this is a reflection. Like, I don't have to take the tank. You know what I mean? Um, I want to know what's there and I want to work it out. I don't want to not know. I'd rather know who I'm dealing with. And, and also a lot of stories, like I said, a lot of stories, it made sense. The grandparents, you know what I mean? Like, this kind of a, kind of a hum or an energy that comes from the past. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important. Um, and I also discovered um, that I was, I discovered relatives because I started joining a lot of genealogy groups and things like that. Um, and I was already, you know, into history, obviously, that's why I wrote all these history books. Um, but re meeting cousins that I was already Facebook friends with was very interesting as well, you know? Because, um, <laughs> you know, it's been amazing. I actually met a cousin during an ancestor reading. Wow. <laughs> you know, but it's all really deep stuff, all of it. And using the oracles to help find people, you know. So it's like, am I going in the right direction? And I'll just, you know, do a reading on that. I've had people call me, you know, I do these ancestor readings to 
you know, find out what their ancestors want from them, but I also can help them if they're stuck. Like, okay, am I going in the right direction? I'll say no. So I've had, you know, instances where I've had people, um, you know, write me back and, you know, say, hey, you were right. I wasn't supposed to look in Kentucky, <laughs> you know. It just, it just works out, you know. So if you use all your spiritual tools, use everything in your spiritual toolbox, you will make some amazing breakthroughs, you know, for yourself, for your family. And even if you don't have children, you can, these stories help somebody, trust me. They will help, you know, friends and, or people, you know, strangers, you know, that you write about these things online or whatever. If you have a blog, people learn from your experiences. So it all, it's all useful. You know what I mean? And I also discovered that Black and white America supposedly just doesn't exist. It only is a fantasy in people's minds because I don't know how many times I've contacted, you know, someone on Ancestry, you know, and it's like, ah, you know, <laughs> you know, because we have the same second great grandfather on our trees. And then the white American person is thinking, wait, what do you mean? This person isn't Black. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather said he was Italian. I'm like, yeah, okay. That's what a lot of people said. <laughs> we get a lot of Greeks, Italians, and Spaniards around the time of the Civil War. <laughs> so some people will delete entire branches off of their tree or delete their entire profile. And not just white people. I know a couple of black people that do it too, that they don't want to face it. Um, they are upset when they discover white people in the family that didn't rape anyone. Okay, that there was an actual interracial relationship going on that was completely consensual. It upsets them. They'd rather find a white rapist in the family because they don't like white people or whatever. So I'm talking about all of these matters because, again, it's all in people's heads. Once you do genealogy, and if, if your, your family has been here prior to the Civil War, more, more, than, life, more than likely you will collide with someone else, you know. Everybody will not have your phenotype. It's like almost impossible considering colonial history, which I also post quite a bit about on my Instagram page, you know. Totally impossible. All this stuff is completely made up, you know. So <laughs> it's like cousins fighting cousins, crazy pretty much. Exactly. And I really appreciate the non-judgmental stance. I think that's so important because that's how I think about psychoanalysis as well. Like it's all there, whether you acknowledge it or not, you know, and you not acknowledging it is just going right. to make things more difficult. So you might as well look at it and not judge it right. and learn about yourself because it's all part of you. Right. I mean, but, you know, people feel like they have to do something. I've had that, you know, as well during ancestor readings and things. It's like, okay, now this information has come up. Um, what do I do about it? It's like, what do you mean? You know what I mean? Like these people had their time here. Now you can do certain rituals depending on, you know, your particular path or what your particular stance is on how these things can be resolved. Because every spiritual tradition, every religion is going to have a different remedy, you know, for how to deal with a, a, a taint or, 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 you know, ancestors that were, unsavory characters, you know, and I don't decide that for people, um, when they call me, that isn't my job. My job is to see what I'm supposed to see, um, and not what they want to hear, but just tell them what I see, and then I leave it up to them. Now, if they have a, a particular leaning towards group work and stuff, then I would, you know, give them how, you know, my advice on that, but you know, I'm not going to give advice from another lineage, another spiritual lineage that I'm unfamiliar with because they have their own elders um, and they have their own, you know, specialists or whatever they call them, priests or whatever. So I just, you know, if I know those people, I often do, I know so many people from so many different traditions, um, I will just tell, you know, point them in the right direction because, you know, if I know someone that's credible, and when I say credible, it doesn't mean necessarily um, you know, in terms of like you know, formal education or whatever, I just make sure that that person is respected in their communities before I would recommend them, you know, because I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of people exploited, you know, um, and people actually I was told I wasn't going to live past 32 years old by somebody that clearly just wanted my mind and my money, you know, 
So of course the remedy is like for twenty nine ninety five per minute, <laughs> I can clean your aura and stuff. And you know, I'm just very fortunate that I was very in tune with my destiny. Um, I was considered very arrogant saying that, you know, telling this woman to her face. I didn't wait till I left the reading. I told this woman that this is absolutely incorrect. And she said, oh, no, I understand. At the time, I was 22, by the way. So I was told when I was 22, I was only going to live 10 more years. So she's just like, just, you may as well just forget about school, drop out of school, just, you know, travel, do whatever you're going to do, because there's no way. Don't even plan to have kids. Just forget it. Your life is over at 32. So just live however. So if I wasn't a stronger person, that was really in tune with myself, I probably would have either went nuts or I would have been in a constant state of anxiety for 10 years, you know? And that's what I really thought when I left that reading, you know, it's like, oh my God, like wonder if I wasn't who I was, you know what I mean? That would have been 10 years of hell, but it wasn't. So I didn't tell anyone, I didn't even tell my best friend because I didn't want anyone else to, you know, have this kind of anxiety about the next 10 years, you know, but it was really, it really sucked for her to do that, you know, just for a couple of bucks, you know, it's like, you can't find another way to make money, you know, rather than take care of, you know, take advantage of people, um, but that's what I've encountered, and I, you know, so I understand a lot of horror stories as well, too, especially when it comes to um, American traditional medicine, aka root work, because that's what I call it, um, and especially when it comes to African traditional religions, which I was involved in for over 20 years as well. Um, I've seen a lot of wonderful, beautiful people, and I've seen some really shady characters, and that kind of keeps people away from those traditions because, you know, they don't want to encounter these kind of people, you know? And so this, they ruin the reputation, unfortunately. And the media doesn't help, right? All these, like, movies, you know, all these people think of child's play or whatever, you know, weird, you know, horror movies. It's fine. Like, I wouldn't mind if, you know, certain traditions were featured in a horror movie. If we had a balance of representation, um, then it would be fine, you know. But it's like a lot of these traditions, these indigenous traditions, only get representation when it's something to be horrified over, you know. So that makes it really, it makes it even worse. And then it makes people not want to ask for anyone, you know, ask for help if they need it, you know. So, well, I do have an astrology book coming out and I wanted to let everybody know about. It. It's called Astrology for Mystics. And it's just an exploration of the water houses in your chart. I am not an astrologer. I am, I've always been interested in astrology, but I'm not interested in the mechanics. Okay, I much prefer, you know, a computer program to do that for me. Um, I'm interested in the philosophy of the stars. I'm interested in the perception of these signs, how they change, because, you know, different animals were used at certain times and places, you know, and, uh, you know, just, just, I think at the core of it, you know, it's all, it's all about just, again, personalizing you know, your experience. So um, Astrology for Mystics is, is an examination of those houses that deal with ancestors, that deal with transitions, um, that deal with, you know, how you're affected generationally, um, aesthetically, because we kind of forget about the importance of aesthetics um, in life. Um, just everything, everything that has to do with water, I'm exploring there, um, and that should be coming out with it by the inner traditions. Um, in February, I believe, of next year, but that, that could that could change because the pandemic has kind of slowed things down. But um, yeah, and so yeah, that's what's that's what's going on there. Um, if anybody wants to contact me, um, and I also should say the Hulu Tarot. I've actually we should t we should touch on this, Vanessa. I've had really weird things. I've heard really strange things from white people that. Um, that there are certain black people that told them that if they're white, they cannot buy the Hulu Tarot. Have you heard anything like that? I have no? my Hulu Tarot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so you haven't heard about this. And I said I was going to address it. So may I do that? Of course. Okay, so just a quick backstory. I was shocked. One day I'm on Facebook 
And this lady tells me like, hey, I just didn't want to be disrespectful, but I bought your book. I'm sorry. It's great though. What? What do you mean? Like, so I, you know, so then finally she tells me, oh yeah, well, I was in like this tarot forum and I got totally reamed for buying the Hoodoo Tarot and called the, the appropriator for buying the book. So I just thought that was really weird. I said, well, where did you buy it? She said, Barnes and Noble. <laughs> and I just couldn't understand. I said, wait a minute. I can understand if I created the deck and I had some kind of society with secrets and, you know, the deck got leaked and now you have or something. But it was in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are white people dropping down from, like, a secret location <laughs> to, like, a Mission Impossible? Like, you know, on a suspended rope? Like, what is unbelievable okay so I just I thought I just couldn't believe that some people were actually taking this seriously but I think because of the conversation about appropriation um, people are genuinely terrified of being uh, accused of you know exploitation um, so which is a whole nother matter I actually wrote an article about um, polydimensional uh, spirituality and laying out how, you know, traditions are kind of mingle and how that works. Usually it comes from commerce and colonization. There are many different seeds that are involved. And I posted that on Instagram as well. Um, my Instagram is Tiana Lee McCorlar, by the way. Um, so it's just, I just hear so many weird things about it. So I just told her, no, it's in Barnes and Noble. Like, <laughs> If I didn't want it public, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have done it, you know. I would have self-published and only distributed it among, you know, Black people, you know. Like, what is this about? So I just wanted to make that very clear for anyone that's listening that may have heard it. Whoever is saying these things has nothing to do with me. They don't know me because if they did, they would know that I would tell them they're being ridiculous. Like I said, this is a lineage. This is about lineage. This is not about crayon colors. This is not about phenotypes. Lineage is lineage, okay? Um, now, I'm representing a lineage, obviously, okay? But there are people with a phenotype similar to yours, right, that have this lineage. And when I say lineage, I mean a maternal line to this country, okay? So you can look any kind of way, okay? and still have a maternal line lineage to the indigenous people of this country. So are people with a certain phenotype the only ones permitted to buy the Hoodoo Tarot or the medicine deck? Or I bought the Voodoo Tarot. I have no lineage in Benin, Nigeria, or Haiti. I bought the Congo Blade uh, Oracle. I'm not Brazilian, nor do I have a lineage from, uh, you know, Yoruba land. Okay, so I also have the Japanese tarot. I'm not Japanese. <laughs> so why is it just the hoodoo tarot that people are trying to create this force field around? You know, so these are the kind of like discussions that, you know, that have been surrounding this deck. So now has it gotten to that point where you have to be Chinese to use the Chinese tarot or whatever you're using? I use, I've been using the I Ching uh, or the I Ching, uh, I think since 98. I'm not Chinese, Vanessa. Okay. <laughs> and I've gotten a lot of nourishment from that oracle. Okay. So I don't know. I don't, it's not coming from me. That's my only point. I don't want to keep ranting about it. If you hear any of this stuff, it is absolutely not coming from me. It is not coming from Caitlin. It's not coming from anything to do with anything I'm about because all people need to, to do if they want to know something and I think you we've been friends on social media a long time Vanessa you know that I'm a straight shooter I say what the hell I want when I want to say it and if anybody has a question I will definitely be forthright and answer that question I don't dance around uncomfortable topics but this particular one I find absolutely ridiculous and I don't entertain it. So I would suggest that you speak to anyone, I don't care what they look like, I suggest you get out of that group as quickly as possible because they are promoting a message that has absolutely nothing to do with me. 
Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that. If people out there want to get in touch with me, they can get in touch with me at tlmcquillar at gmail.com. That's T-L-M-E-Q-U-I-L-L-A-R at gmail.com. Contact me if you'd like a reading. Um, check out my Instagram page. Follow me on Facebook. I'm probably not going to be there too much longer. I'm kind of thinking about that a lot of drama and things, you know. Um, but anyway, I'm accessible. And, you know, I want to hear from everybody, your phenotype, your ethnic origins, your sexual orientation, all of these things. And I'm not just saying that because it's the flavor of the month and the flavor of the decade. I really could give a damn if you are a decent human being. Um, you know, I want to hear from you. And that's just, that's just the bottom line. That's just Tayana. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Tiana Lee McQuiller. For more, follow her at Instagram at Tiana Lee McQuiller. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair.net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious.org Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. I whispered sweetly into the white She's man's made canvas. With the I'm devil. leaving a trail of sweet grass for anyone who wants to find me. I'll tie it witch. to fences as I travel with ribbons and one great coin. And maybe you too can travel this road. But I must warn you that this the path is not an easy one to walk. There will be bumps, ditches. People will call your names and close their doors to you. But if you listen close enough Something and the wind calls your name, then you too can travel with me. And I can tell you like that there's a sweet growl, a lot. The tiger, and then, before then those attacks, doors will open. I open the good book and place my finger down. I wonder sometimes the twigs of the, the cedar tree you brought to the marketplace body. and left in bundles. If it is my the seed body, of the lamb planted like willow by abundant water that spread creating roots. This is what the good book told me, so I collected the branches and bundled them with twine. While cedar protected what against lightning, the willow was sympathetic to the queen. The poppet on a separate journey would I be placed in the river. The a man would see the interaction and the I sign would be given that all was well. I walked the old streets with new markings. I remember the days of flipping streetlights and broken glass. It was the the remnants of my friend's former home became cinder blocks being pushed through the windows of my former home. I didn't know what to think of this ghetto turned prime location. The inferno was in with fire. It's filled with memories and dilapidated buildings. It was built on pavement, leveling layers of history and patching the the cracks with cement, therein concealing its former existence. The inferno buries its history in skyscrapers and low-income housing in the floor. The inferno doesn't want you to sense the gardens. It only wants you to feel the void. This is the curse of the land. By the deadly night shade, I walked into the old temple. I roamed the halls, touching old stone and tracing my fingers along glass. It was the stained glass in the chapels that spoke. 
The carvings, the, the tapestries with years of history, and blood, and toil, the way she weaved into them and like expressed their language wholly. The in the I halls, the echoes of voices. It reminded me of a small town so in Canada haunted by radio airwaves. In the garden, I touched poison. By the deadly nightshade, there were bitter sweet berries known as wind I, I remembered their taste. The wind had become calm and gentle, gentle the way she gets before change occurs. Seven I lit the white candles in jars of honey, so many hopes and wishes crammed into sweetness with locks of hair and photographs. I, opened a good book I said a prayer for each one of them. Down. Blowing three times the twigs before lighting the, the cedar match. tree Seven would be all. brought to the marketplace Two, and left zero, in bundles. One, four. The seed of the land is a planted like willow by abundant water. The dominant frequency of thunder three, is a hundred hertz with a rumble of infrasonic This is what the good book told me to do. Something inaudible so to humans but resonating the like a low growl of a tiger before it attacks its paralyzed blood. Yeah, cedar protected I wonder sometimes what the frequency the of my body was. If it's my body that haunts me or the outside sources. What is the frequency of all that haunts you? River. What is the frequency of the ancestors' rage? She's made friends with the devil. They say she is a witch. My enemy's tears. I walked the old streets. Reveling layers of history and patching the cracks with cement. Therein concealing its former existence. The infernal buries its history with skyscrapers and low income housing few can afford. The inferno doesn't want you to sense the layers, it only wants you to feel the void. This is the curse of I didn't land. know what to think of this. I walked into the old Ghetto, temple. I roamed the halls, ocean. touching old stone and tracing my fingers the along glass. Isn't filled it was the stained fire. glass in the chapels it's that spoke. Filled with memories the carvings, the tapestries buildings. with years of history, blood, it was and built toil, on weaved into them and expressed their language wholly. Of history and in the halls, the echoes of voices. It reminded me of a small town in Canada haunted by radio airwaves. In the, the garden, I touched berries. By the deadly nightshade, there were bitter sweet berries known as woody nightshade. I remembered their taste. The, the wind had become calm and gentle, the, the way she gets before change occurs. It only wants I lit the white candles and jars of honey. So many hopes this and wishes crammed into sweetness with locks of hair and photographs. I, I said a prayer for each one of them, blowing three times before lighting the match. Seven and all. Two, zero, one. I'll tie it to fences that year as I travel seven. with ribbons and one gold coin. The dominant and then frequency you too of thunder is a hundred hertz with a rumble of infrasonic in between. But I must warn you that this path is something not inaudible easy to humans, to but resonating like a low growl of a tiger before it attacks its paralyzed people brain. Call you names I wonder sometimes what the frequency you. of my body was. But if you listen if it's my body that haunts me or outside name, sources, then you too what is the frequency of all that haunts you? What is the frequency of an ancestor's rage? In that alone. She's made friends with the and devil. Then, they say she's a witch. Then those doors will open.